Um, we can say, well, you know, I need uh, more luxury goods or, <laughs> you know, I need a massage or, or whatever. These, th these would be, we're just using the term need to mean I really want something or I have a strong preference. Uh, but in self-determination theory, we use the term need to really refer to a, a, a different definition, the idea that something's necessary or essential to somebody's well-being, growth, and development. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the term need here really means more about necessity. And so when we think about what's the psychological needs that people have are that are, um, and in order to be a basic psychological need, we'd have to be, it's something that applies to everybody, it's something that applies across cultures, it's something that applies across development. There's gonna be very few of those. But for people to be well, to people to develop in a healthy way, they need to experience in an ongoing way opportunities for mastery and competence. They need to feel connected with other people and safe and secure in a social network. That's relatedness. And they need to feel uh, the capacity to be self-directed and self-regulating, which is the issue of autonomy. Welcome to the Manifested Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Leandro, your host. Today's guest is Dr. Richard Ryan, clinical psychologist and co-developer of self-determination theory, one of the most influential theories of human motivation. Dr. Ryan lectures frequently in the United States and abroad on the factors that promote motivation unhealthy psychological and behavioral functioning. Dr. Ryan, thank you very much for being here today. Leandro, thank you very much for inviting me. To start our conversation, could you please comment about motivation in relation to behavior regulation? I would be interested in learning what the different aspects of behavior, of behavior when you study the, the behavior, there are different uh, aspects of motivation that they are concerned um, with action. I believe that there are three. Yeah. Well, you know, basically when we think about the concept of motivation, we think about what moves people to act. And we can be moved into action by many different things. We can be moved into action because external forces pressure us or force us to do something. We can be moved into action because there's a carrot or a reward that's dangling in front of us. We can also be moved into action because we're interested or inspired uh, to do something from the inside. So we can see both internal and external forces that move people to action. So motivation is a very big concept, many different kinds of motivation. And I think in self-determination theory, we've been really interested in what's the difference between when you're motivated by things that are pushing you around from the outside versus you're pursuing the things that you interest or that you're deeply interested in or highly value. Oh, wonderful. And in relation of their different uh, perspectives when you look at motivation, uh, my question would be about the classical study of motivation relating to, related to conditioning. If you could comment about the, I think it's called the classical mode of motivation, yeah. where if you have like an organism and, an, and if you control the environment, you can, con you can control the behavior as well. Yeah, well, you know, I was raised in those traditions myself, uh, you know, trained in behavioral uh, science when I was a young person. And I'm, I don't dispute the findings from behaviorism. Uh, oh. The findings, though, apply only in a pretty uh, unusual setting when you have total control over an organism. So if you, if you can control an organism, keep it in a cage or a box and control all the rewards and punishments that beset it, you can drive it to do many things, not anything, but almost anything. The trouble is, is that people aren't in a cage like that. If they don't like your reinforcement contingencies or they don't like the way in which you reward or punish them, they leave that cage. They go to a new cage. Uh, you know, we, you can't keep people in cages these days. You know, right now people might be listening to us uh, if they don't like what we're saying. They go do something else. They surf the web. They do. They, you know, you can't keep people that way. So, I think what that's one of the practical reasons why motivation theories turned away from the question of how can you control people from the outside to trying to understand more what motivates people from within. So, if you take take your your last sentence, what can motivate people from within? Then we we are talking about intrinsic versus in extrinsic motivation. If you could uh, comment what would be the difference between intrinsic 
and extrinsic? Well, intrinsic motivation is defined as those things that we would do spontaneously just because the activity itself is interesting or enjoyable. You know, so when children play, I guess this is the prototype of intrinsic motivation. You don't have to reward children to play. They play just because it's fun. And, uh, and while they're playing, many good things are happening. They're learning, they're developing. But uh, the reason for them playing is not because of any external pressures or rewards. So play is a place where people learn, they do it, they continue to sustain engagement in that, and they don't need external prompting to do it. So it's a classic case of intrinsic motivation. Uh, but, you know, we all have intrinsically motivated activities. You know, I have a hobby where I like to paint. Uh, I don't get paid for that. No one uh, compliments me on that. It's just because I enjoy the activity itself. So even as adults, we have intrinsically motivated activities. So intrinsically motivated activities are kind of a prototype of motivation within. But I kind of want to say that's not the only type of motivation from within. We can also be inspired to do something because we think it's important or has value. And in this case, it's extrinsically motivated because you're trying to attain an end that's separate from the behavior, but you're doing it for highly internalized reasons and uh, for things that you really stand behind. We call that autonomous extrinsic motivation or identified motivation uh, because you really identify with what you're doing. Um, and those things, too, are uh, coming from within. Wonderful. So what... When I think about those things, about motivation from within, it really has those two types, uh, doing it because you're interested or doing it because you really see the value or worth in something. I'm sorry, Leandro, I didn't mean to interrupt. I think it's, it's completely fine. So in this case, how could re rewards affect motivation and, and performance when you talk well, about extrinsic? Well, rewards are a complicated matter. Um, some of our early studies were really trying to demonstrate that when you use a reward to control somebody else's behavior, it runs the risk of undermining their intrinsic motivation. And many studies, I think, bear this out. Uh, so some rewards are controlling. We're using them in an attempt to make other people do what we want them to do. And that changes the style of their motivation. But sometimes rewards are just acknowledgments for jobs well done or uh, a recognition of the uh, competence somebody has shown. And in that case, they don't undermine. So in self-determination theory, we have a very uh, uh, a distinction about rewards. We say some rewards are controlling because they're trying to manage your behavior from the outside. And some are informational. Some are kind of giving you feedback like you're doing a good job. And the uh, informational rewards don't undermine, uh, but the controlling ones do. Now I'm thinking about uh, what you said, autonomous extrinsic. And I'm thinking about a, a, an example, uh, as I see from my perspective, that would be a case of extrinsic motivation. And in this example, I'll give you, I, I believe that it would be a superior way of extrinsic uh, motivation that is superior than intrinsic. It's about for instance, in e sports, a young athlete will train very hard to enter competition, and his sole motivation is to be the best, to be the number one. In this case, would the athlete be mainly extrinsic motivated or motivated by an external reward? Well, it's certainly not intrinsic motivation. Because if he were intrinsically or she were intrinsically motivated, the athlete would be saying, I just love my sport. Yeah. I'm doing this because I love the competition, because I enjoy this activity, not because I need to be number one. So when I'm going to be number one, uh, I, I, you know, because we need to dig in further, but my guess is that uh, that's what we would call first a performance goal. And typically it's driven by a lot of uh, what we would call interjection or self-esteem pressures. And uh, so the person is very ego involved, and we would call that an, uh, a, a controlled form of motivation. And it has many risks associated with it. For instance, suppose this person doesn't become number one. They lose quickly more interest in their sport than the person who's just playing it for the love of the game itself, because they're not dependent on getting the number one in order to stay in. But the person whose goal only is to be the best may not stay in if they can't see themselves as being the best. So you see right there a difference in the functional impact of those two different motivations. It makes complete sense because I'm thinking in the same line of thought, let's say that the same 
athlete playing professionally for, let's say, when he's past 30 years old. And his performance, of course, it decreases. And his main motivation would have to go from this extrinsic or performance goal-oriented to be more intrinsic because it yeah. makes happy or for any other reason. Uh, could you please comment if, if as a human being, as the human being develops and his interest develops, is there any case that the way the intrinsic versus extrinsic, I don't know if I can call this, would change uh, towards the same object? Well, I think, you know, we, we argue in self-determination theory that people are generally prone to want to internalize social mm -hmm. practices. You know, we would like to take things on and make them our own if they're in any way consistent. So the general trajectory of human development and in, in therefore in, in across age is that people move in a direction of being more self-regulated or autonomous where they can. That doesn't mean that people always do. So some people work their jobs their entire life without ever feeling autonomous in their jobs. They do it always because they feel like they're pressured or have to do it. Other people, of course, you know, find a job where they find value, purpose, and mission in the job and therefore uh, can pursue it autonomously. So people differ very much in this. But, but if you ask on average, I think on average people uh, move toward things that they can feel um, ownership of and uh, autonomy in engaging. And how, how would the number of choices affect the, if the person would pursue more um, fulfilling um, goal or more intrinsic motivation goal. Let's let's give an example of an of an environment of a person that the only option this person has is to work. Let's say work in a factory, and even the 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 number of choices, the number of factories this person can be because ge geographically uh, yeah. it's very limited. How can someone in this in this type of environment? How could someone psychologically deal with not being able to pursue his? Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, people have we have argued and we've shown experiments where if you give people choice, they yeah. tend to feel more autonomous for what they're doing, and so choice is one of the facilitators of of autonomy and intrinsic motivation and internalization. But I think it's important to note that you can be highly autonomous for doing something even when you ha only have one choice. Yeah. Uh, let's say that uh, you know, my, my only choice is one of, uh, of being a psychologist. It happens I love being a psychologist. So this choice, the only choice I have, happens to be one I can stand behind. So it's not about the number of choices. It's whether the choices that you have match your interests and your values. And the reason that choice typically helps autonomous motivation is it gives you options that better fit with who you are. But if you only have one option, but it happens to be the one that really fits, you can be fully behind what you're doing. Um, so, uh, so I, I think it's uh, I think people get confused sometimes thinking more choices is always better. Sometimes you can have a thousand choices and it doesn't help you feel autonomous because it's too many choices. It's cognitive overload. It's just confusing. You know, consumers going into a store and they see 25 different types of shaving cream. Okay, none of it matters. It's just cognitive load. It's not increasing freedom or autonomy. <laughs> so uh, choice is complicated again, but uh, the main idea being if you have the choices that include the options that will really matter to you, then you're going to feel more autonomous. So if someone have, has only one choice and doing, let's say, a repetitive job, over yeah. and over again, there would be ways to be motivated just, let's say, and, and I'm thinking about flow theory as well, by trying to focus on what you're doing and trying to do it better in any kind of ways, being it faster or more precise or... Yeah, would yeah. You, I, would I, I, people will try and make uh, a game or fun out of anything that's really tedious like that. And that tells us something about human nature, which is that human nature requires that kind of stimulation. Just to stay alert and alive and feel okay, you have to do something that then ends up to feel like more 
uh, informational, more engaging, more competence feedback. And so, you know, I myself, I worked on a, in a laundry factory at one point in time. So very, very tedious, boring job, folding towels as they come off an assembly line. You know, I made up games for myself on, uh, you know, see if I could pile up towels faster than the person next to me or see if I could uh, do X by, uh, you know, lunchtime or break, uh, you know, just to just to create interest in an otherwise tedious job. And lots of people do that. Uh, and, and it tells us a lot about our need for interest and stimulation, no matter what our context. Uh, wonderful. Before we, we explore a bit more about the self-theory, self-development theory, could you comment about the way the studies are done, uh, the free choice behavioral metric of intrinsic motivation, for instance? How how do you set up these type of studies? How how is what is the process? Well, so, you know, so first, Leandro, you know, we use many different kind of methodologies in okay. in uh, SDT, but uh, some of the experimental methodologies have been trying to look at uh, at the. Uh, free choice, what we call the free choice period or intrinsic motivation. And the way such an experiment works is as follows, which is, let's say that uh, I have some children and I bring them into a laboratory setting and I give them an activity that is uh, hopefully fun and interesting. Let's say it's a puzzle and they engage in the puzzle for a while and to half the children, I'll say something like, uh, uh, you know, if you do more of these puzzles, I will give you a dollar for each one you do. So I give them a financial reward. Another condition, I just say, you know, Lori, I'd like you to do more of these puzzles. So they both engage in the activity for a while, some being paid, some not being paid. And then we end the experiment. We say the experiment's over, and we're, we're going to leave you here in the room for a bit. You can do more of the same activity if you want to, or you can read magazines or just stay here. We'll be back in uh, a little bit. And then when we leave, they think no one's watching them, no one's evaluating, no one's rewarding. And we watch what they do. And if they return to the activity because no one's watching them, no one's pressuring them, they must be doing it because of interest. So we time how much time do they spend on that activity? And a common finding, for instance, is people who've been given rewards for doing the activity when they're in a free choice period, they don't turn back to the activity. But people who've never been rewarded are more likely to still be interested and go back and do more of it. Uh, so we look at the length of persistence. We call that the you know, the kind of gold standard behavioral measure of intrinsic motivation, and that's used in many laboratory experiments. Uh, you can manipulate many things, not just rewards, but how you talk to people, the kind of feedback you give them, the way in which you give them directives. Uh, all kinds of things can be manipulated in those kinds of experiments to see what impacts people's likelihood of persisting or sustaining behavior when nobody else is watching. Okay. And um Touching on rewards, let's say that you have a person, that the person is already motivated for doing a specific um, action, and you would like to reward this person, or you, you want to create a reward system, let's say to improve performance. I'm, I'm just thinking about the sports or something that I work with. And what would be the, would be the, best, the best way to, to have a reward system to an intrinsic motivation, motivated person that doesn't undermine the motivation by just giving money up front to say, okay, you have to do this and be motivated. Well, you know, there's a couple of presumptions in that. One is that there's going to be a reward system that would actually effectively improve performance. And I'm not sure about the assumption. You know, the first is if I have already engaged in the sport, for instance, and they're not performing well, I want to find out what's in the way of their performing well. Before I assume that it's not enough rewards, it's hardly ever the case that an athlete is not performing well because they look around and they say, gee, there's not enough rewards here. Mm. That's not why they're not performing well. It's usually because they have a skill issue. They want to perform better. Athletes already want to perform better. They're intrinsically motivated to want to perform better. So they don't need a reward to perform better. They need information. And they need, uh, well, so what we would call is informational coaching. They need a coach who's going to, in a non-controlling way, give them feedback that they can then assimilate. And there's been lots of studies in SDT on how do you give good feedback? But the main feedback is don't be critical. Don't be humiliating. <laughs> give feedback that's actually going to help in skill Make sure they're 
the feedback is not comparative. It's not about how you're doing next to the next player. It's how you're doing relative to how you could do. That's what we're focused on. So, you know, feedback should be information. We call it efficacy relevant or effectance relevant. It should be really feedback that helps you improve. And then athletes love this kind of feedback, even when it's negative. If it helps them improve, this will enhance their, their motivation to continue to play. So, the, you know, the first thing I'd think about is what's the performance problem? And let's solve that before we start throwing rewards into the picture, which may actually make it worse rather than better. Wonderful. So uh, if, I, if I can understand, you look at the skill set, you look at the coast coaching strategy, uh, what kind of information the person needs. And if yep. you're coaching, you're coaching in a, no, in a non-controlling way and also yeah. in a non-critical way. Right. You're not criticizing the person. You can criticize yeah. the skill or the behavior because you're giving information about what could be improved or what's going wrong in the mechanics, for instance. But you're not criticizing the person like, oh, you are terrible at this or you're not you know working hard enough these are not the this is not a way to give mm. feedback the way to give feedback is to say you know i notice that x is happening there you want to try this experiment with this how does that one feel you know you're you're working with the athlete to help them get their skill improved without it being a, an exercise in social comparison or or personal evaluation <laughs> and in this case for the coach it would be helpful as well to understand what actually motivates the, the the athlete? As we said, some athletes, if you have a non a person that is is performing is performing in a non competitive way and you want to increase performance, it may be different that a person that is his for a season for a training season that the specific goal is a specific tournament. That the approach may be different as well. The way the, the way the information and the way the, the, the constructive criticism is, is delivered. Do you agree? Well, you know, again, I, I, I keep getting back to the, I keep hearing in there that somebody has a goal that they have to get to some place. Yeah. And if I'm a good coach, I'm, every game is my goal. The next game is my goal. Yeah. And I want to be my best in this next moment, whatever that is. It's not always looking ahead to the, we're going to get here at the end of the season, and that's our goal. Our goal is to be good tomorrow, today. You know, so mm -hmm. it's it's really about an, in an ongoing way helping people be their best, not not saying we're going to be our best because we're going to get to X. You know, I think that's a terrible setup for a goal. Let's say if my my only goal is to get to the championship, and yet we're not set up to make the playoffs, mm -hmm. what does that do to my team at the end of the season? We already not have our goal. The goal is to play well, is to improve as players, to always do well, not, not to win championships, not to have uh, the most money. Not to, <laughs> it, it's, to, it's to play this game as well as we can play. And then, of course, you know, the good outcome of that is we'll probably win championships if we do that. We'll probably make more money if we do that. In other words, the outcome can't be the goal. The goal is the process. Let's have the best process we can, and then the, the outcomes will take care of themselves. So in this case, I will move this perspective to a different perspective that would yeah. be self-realization -reali and self-actualization. Let's say then you're talking as an individual is let's let's for an analogy as a grow uh, the tree the tree grows as gets grows as, as much as it can. So as an individual. As an indiv indiv uh, as a person, yourself as an athlete, for instance, you will grow and develop your skills as much as you feel like, as much as it's possible, according to your skills, according if your if your body, according if your your ca yep. capacities, and the ultimate goal: how can how can we bring self actualization? Um, by doing what we love and doing the best without comparing with other people with, or with the next athlete would be something, and a perspective that w would you agree better? I would, I would, I would. I think each person, you know, actualizing the excellences and the skills that they have is, is really, 
you know, what we look for. And it's not always about winning and it's not always about the outcomes. And I think a lot of times when people get focused on the outcomes or the winning, they undermine the very things that lead to uh, good performance in sport. They start to get controlling. They get their players more tense and rigid. They get ego involvement going. Uh, there can be a lot of things that actually interfere with the very goal of achieving by uh, putting too much pressure on achievement. Just to make a remark in Indian philosophy, there's a, there's a little book called uh, Bhagavad Gita. And in this yeah. in this book, uh, one 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 teaching of this book is you you act without expecting re reward for your action. You act because you have to, because it's your duty, as yeah. they say, because it's your karma. So you don't care yeah. about the re the rewards. Then when you act, you act you do the best you you possibly can. It will yeah. be something on this line. Yeah, yeah, you know. Um, Research, I think, also suggests that maybe the worst kinds of reward structures are what we call outcome-focused rewards, where you start to give people money because they reach a certain benchmark or certain goal. And then what you find is it really contaminates motivation, leading people to do anything they can get do to get to that goal, even if it's not the right way, uh, because it, uh, it takes out all the other motives that are in there and gets everybody focused only on the end point. Uh, High-stakes testing and education is a good example of that. Or in sports, the coach who's only focused on winning, these are these are things where you know because they have a bonus at the end of the season or whatever, uh, these things really can uh, be damaging to motivation over time. So, I, I like the Bhagavad Gita in terms of its uh, <laughs> <laughs> mentality here. <laughs> okay, great. So we have agreed on this. So let's move to the next next question. It will be according to self develop the self determinist theory. Uh, there are basic needs that have to be met to promote well-being. And you comment on your, your research, there are three basic, basic needs. Um, could you, first of all, just to, to, to break this down a little bit between, if you could differentiate between basic psychological needs and a strong preference. Sure. You know, when we use it, I mean, the term need is uh, a funny word because we can use it in different ways in yeah. the English language anyway. Um, we can say, well, you know, I need uh, more luxury goods or, you know, I need a massage or, or whatever. These, these would be, we're just using the term need to mean I really want something or I have a strong preference. Uh, but in self-determination theory, we use the term need to really refer to a, a, a different definition, the idea that something's necessary or essential to somebody's well-being, growth, and development. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the term need here really means more about necessity. And so when we think about what's the psychological needs that people have are that are, um, and in order to be a basic psychological need, we have to be it's something that applies to everybody. It's something that applies across cultures. It's something that applies across development. There's going to be very few of those. But for people to be well, to people to develop in a healthy way, they need to experience in an ongoing way, opportunities for mastery and competence. They need, need to feel connected with other people and safe and secure in a social network. That's relatedness. And they need to feel uh, the capacity to be self-directed and self-regulating, which is the issue of autonomy. So we say there are three things we've identified, which is if you don't have any one of these three things, you will be hurting in terms of well-being or uh, development. And those are autonomy, competence, and relatedness needs. There might be other basic psychological needs, but by this definition, they would have to be something that would show itself to be universal, cross-developmental, and satisfaction, chances of deprivation decreases well-being. And there's very few psychological variables that fit that definition. I'm thinking here about other researchers, Abraham Maslow theory of human motivation, uh, the work done by Carol Reef as well as psychological well-being, and also yeah. Chick Semahai on, on flow theory. And they also uh, uh, identify uh, autonomy or competence or re re uh, relatedness as well as part of the dimensions that, that they, they focus on. Um, so it would be these three would be a person cannot function with, or is something that, okay, we can, um, how to say, 
you can you can there's no self actualization without fulfilling properly yeah. those three yeah. needs yeah i mean i would say maslow didn't really have a concept of autonomy deeply understood within his psychology so he doesn't distinguish autonomous versus controlled events and uh, his his hierarchy of needs is is a bit of a different theory. Uh, okay. It's more about the ordering of basic needs. Um, but you know, at least he, I you know, I give Maslow credit for thinking about the problem of human needs in the in the true sense of what is it that people really require to flourish. So uh, he was on that track. When I think of Chixin Mihai's work, you know, I'm I actually am a big fan of uh, of Chixin Mihai, uh, but he was not focused on autonomy either. He's really focused on competence. The uh, whole, whole issue is, are you uh, within your zone of competence? Are things over-challenging or under-challenging? So he really focused only on one of the three basic needs. Um, although I think if you read his writing, you see he implies autonomy throughout. <laughs> uh, so it's in there, but it's in there more implicitly. And Carol Riff's theory is not a theory about needs. It's really what, uh, Her theory is really a description of what does a self-actualized person look like? And of course, she includes in that description that they tend to be people who have a high sense of mastery, high sense of relatedness, and high sense of autonomy. So uh, I agree with Carol in, in this regard. <laughs> so. Oh, wonderful. Could you um, tell me, uh, I'm just thinking about uh, how the uh, social, environmental social context can affect intrinsic motivation. Would we be intrinsic motivated for things that they are, or the, would the, it be more likely to be int uh, intrinsic motivated by, for things that are in the context of our culture or in our realm of knowledge? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So maybe ask me again. Uh, yeah, okay, I let me let me try to rephrase. Um, I'm thinking about the social context of things that people are motivated about, let's say uh, skill sets or uh, let's talk about the skill set or something that I would like to learn. Some yeah. is, is, so um, I'm thinking about social context, th things, things that I, I have been exposed to uh, yeah. before. So I have a, a, a prior knowledge of the thing existing. So I get yeah. interested if I see people. If I don't know anything about guitars or piano, I haven't right. seen a piano. Yeah, you can't develop intrinsic motivation for something you don't have access to or resources yeah. around. Yeah. I've been writing a, a, a chapter with a, a friend of mine, Paul Evans, on uh, music and the development of elite musicians. And it's a good example of that. You know, it's hard to become a musician if you grow up in an environment where no one around you plays any instruments and there's no kind of uh, musical activity in your area. Uh, but, you know, music is so deep in human nature that people find ways to play music. So almost in every society, there are some people who will gravitate toward music and find interest in it, but they still need the exposure. And I'm, I'm just asking, I don't know if this is, is even relevant to your work, but would you say that the need, there is a need for music as, as one not basic need, but music is something necessary for developing, development of of a being, of a person, a healthy adult. Well, you know, we, we've been talking about that a lot. You know, obviously music is, is pretty universal. It's, it's, you don't find any societies that don't have music. And music is so much grew out of, I guess, uh, what you can say is kind of the patterns of human communication that it's hard in a way to separate music from communication and relatedness in the first place. Music itself is a relational uh, activity that we do with others and use to communicate with others. So uh, it's not so much that I would call music the need, but I think music fulfills our, some of our basic needs. It fulfill, you know, it gives us that, uh, that activity that we can feel some efficacy in. It allows us to connect with other people. So it helps fulfill relatedness. And it's something we do volitionally and, uh, for, uh, out of our own willingness. So all three psychological needs are satisfied typically when we're engaged in uh, music for fun. Now, of course, elite musicians, they face like athletes, you know, sports is intrinsically motivated too, typically until you get into the, the pressures of, <laughs> of competitive elite sports. And that's the same is true with musicians. So it gets complicated, but inherently music is intrinsically motivated and supports basic needs rather than being a need in its own right. 
Wonderful. So I'm just thinking here about about our conversation and and the way the way you're approaching motivation, it is very related to a way of person seeks for self actualization, fulfillment in life. And so I would be it strongly tells me that there's a, a big relationship between the intrinsic motivation and searching for the things that we 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 uh, we like and the meaning in life itself. Well, you know, it. I think that's true. You know, self actualization is a term that comes out of humanistic psychology, and it's not a term that we use technically within SDT. Uh, but SDT is an organismic theory. It says that as long as we're alive, as long as we're active, as long as we have vitality, we're going to be moving in a direction of trying to increase our sense of competence and understanding of the world around us. We're going to be trying to connect with other people. We're going to be trying to find those things that are of interest and of value to us. Those are the basic psychological needs. And when you fulfill those things, uh, you could describe that as self-actualization. We would describe that as full functioning and as wellness. And, uh, of course, those things are, I guess, in a certain sense, equivalent to the idea of, of, of self-actualization. So, so I, I guess, Leandro, the answer is yes. Great. great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, Jess, if, if someone would like to contact you to learn more about the work you are doing, uh, where is the best place to find all this information? Well, we have, a, we have a website that's uh, selfdeterminationtheory.org, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's actually a website that's just recently been expanded quite a bit. It contains a lot of the articles uh, and or the links to the articles that are, you know, make up the basic science. It also has uh, short descriptions of applications of SDT in many different areas. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where you can watch lectures uh, on self-determination from different people. In fact, we just had the uh, uh, the seventh international uh, self-determination theory conference in Amsterdam, and most of the keynote lectures for that conference are now up on the YouTube, the self-determination theory uh, YouTube channel. Um, so uh, online, you can get gain a lot of resources uh, uh, about SDT. We also have a book that we just published uh, in 2017. That's probably the most comprehensive book on the theory. It's called Self-Determination Theory. <laughs> Very original name, you can tell. Uh, <laughs> if someone would like to, to buy this book, what, where is the best place to go? Is there oh, your well, website? I think uh, on the website there's, there's information about where you can get it. Of course, you know, um, everything can be purchased through uh, Amazon and other places like that. Uh, oh, so you can order it through your local bookstore. It's published by Guilford. Uh, so, uh, so, and uh, it's currently uh, being considered for translation into multiple languages. So, hopefully, it'll be out uh, for everybody soon. <laughs> wonderful! Uh, it's a wonderful conversation, Dr. Ryan. Uh, before we finish, can I ask you just a few few questions, like a rapid fire questions? Sure. Okay. I don't know if I can give you rapid fire answers, there, Andrew, but I'll. <laughs> you, you, you know what happened with these rap, rapid fire questions? I start with okay, rapid fire questions, but then I ask why was it, and they're not even. <laughs> it's like te they're technically rapid fire questions, but let's see how far we go. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite book? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I mean, I'm a big reader, uh, <laughs> so I would have to think about this. Um, you know, I. I'm I'm not a, a fiction reader. Uh, I'm mostly nonfiction, so you know I, I, I've spent a lot of time in my life on Aristotle's. Uh, I think it's a book I keep. I suppose my other favorite book that I dip into over and over is Jane Lovinger's book, uh, uh, doc, Ego Development. Doctor Ryan, I I missed the fir the name of the first book, I believe. Oh, the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, in fact, it's right here because I'm working on, I'm working on, okay, related <laughs> Aristotle. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah. so that's one that I would I would put up there as a favorite. It's really about how to live a good life. And what's your favorite movie? Ooh, also, I'm not, again. Well, unlike reading, I'm a big reader. I'm not much of a movie goer, but if I think of favorite movies 
Uh, they'd mostly be in the past and they'd be big epics. I love like big. So I think of Dr. Zhivago or Reds, you know, those big Russian epics <laughs> like that. Those are the movies I like, why, I think. Why, why is Dr. Zhivago so good? Well, because it, uh, it, it plays out the arc of a story over a big historical span, and you get both the history and the character development in the same uh, place. The same with the movie Reds, which was a Warren Beatty movie, also took place in Russia. You know, it takes place over an expanse of historical activities, and at the same time, it's deep and rich and you know, photographically um, fun. So those are the kind of movies I like, big epics. What's uh, your favorite hobby? Mm. Well, I, uh, I paint, and so I spend a lot of time doing oil painting and, uh, in particular. Is there any specific style, any specific painter you like to? Hmm. Well, my favorite painter is a painter whose name is Rockwell Kent. And uh, he was uh, both a, a painter and a writer. Um, always been one of my favorites. And I suppose some of my painting tries to emulate some of his works. Uh, not, not, not well, but <laughs> in an intrinsically motivated way. <laughs> <laughs> an inspirational person. Inspirational person, hmm. Well, I've, you know, I've, I've had a lot of inspirational people in my life, and most of them are not famous people, people that, you know, that it's, it's, it's the, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, name a person who I, I don't even need to name, but it's a person I know who has spent her life making sure that she doesn't put a big ecological footprint down, who really pays attention to what she's doing around uh, you know, pollution and waste and uh, how she consumes and those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, I've lived near her for a while and I've always admired uh, the way she has the broader picture in mind in each of the small things she does in life. A place you would like to visit? Hmm. Well, Andrew, I get to travel a lot <laughs> in my life because uh, it's so much inherent uh, in my job. Uh, you know, I live in Sydney half the year and I live in the United States, uh, uh, Georgia and Rochester uh, half the year. So I, I get around a lot. Um, so I've been to a lot of places I would really like to go. I suppose a place I haven't been that I would like to go um, I think I'd like to go to Thailand. I have not been to Thailand. And, uh, you know, just uh, some of the culture and some of the ideas and some of the uh, religious uh, uh, sites that are there are things that I'd like to see. I've always had a deep interest in Buddhism, and there's some temples there that are really interesting. And to finish, you could complete the sentence. A, minimum, a meaningful life for me is... <laughs> One filled with love, one filled with interest, uh, and, uh, and one filled with contributions. Dr. Richard Ryan, thank you very much for your time. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been fun talking with you today.